My mom has a permanently stuck in the 80s thing. We're talking teased up feathered hair, acid wash denim jacket, and shoulder pads. So many shoulder pads. But I just got a new phone from AT&T. And check this out. I got a second phone to gift my mom. So now she can finally ditch her old one for a phone that can actually stream all the 80s shows she loves. Come into an AT&T store and find out how to get a smartphone on us. AT&T. More for your thing. That's our thing. See store for details. Hello, this is the Brief History Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Knight. This week's episode, episode 8, is on the Boxer Rebellion. Thank you for everybody who voted in the recent Twitter poll on the choice of this week's episode. As it's such a success, we will do that next week. Please reach out to us on social media. We're on Facebook at the Brief History Podcast. Same as Instagram. And our Twitter handle is at B History Podcast. Please keep in touch. As always, the success of any new podcast relies on the generosity of his listeners. Thank you already if you've left a review, given us five star rating, or shared any of the episodes, or spoken to any of your friends and family about this and got them to listen. Please carry on. The Boxer Rebellion, or Boxer Uprising, was a violent anti-foreign, anti-colonial and anti-Christian uprising that took place in China between 1899 and 1901, towards the end of the Qing Dynasty. It was initiated by the Militia United in Righteousness, known in English as the Boxers, for many of their members have been practitioners of Chinese martial arts also referred to in the West as Chinese boxing. They were motivated by proto-nationalist sentiments and by opposition to Western colonialism and Christian missionary activity that is associated with it. The uprising took place against a backdrop that included severe drought and disruption caused by the growth of foreign spheres of influence. After several months of growing violence in Shandong, and the North China Plain against both the foreign and Christian presence in June 1990. Boxer fighters, convinced they were invulnerable to foreign weapons, converged on Beijing with the slogan, quote, support the Qing government and exterminate the foreigners, end quote. Foreigners and Chinese Christians sought refuge in the Lijian quarter. In response to reports of armed invasion to lift the siege, the initially hesitant Empress Dowager Zizi supported the boxers on June 21st issued an imperial degree declaring war on the foreign powers. Diplomats, foreign civilians and soldiers as well as Chinese Christians in the legislation quarter were placed under siege by the Imperial Army of China and the boxers for 55 days. Chinese official done was split between those supporting the boxers and those favourite consideration led by Prince Qi. The Supreme Commander of the Chinese Forces, Manchu General Zheng Lu, later claimed that he acted to protect the besieged foreigners. The Eight Nation Alliance, after being initially turned back, brought 20,000 armed troops to China, defeated the Imperial Army, and arrived at Peking on August the 14th, relieving the siege. Uncontrolled plunder of the capital and the surrounding countryside ensued, along with a summary execution of those suspected of being boxers. The Boxer Protocol of the 7th of June, September 1901 provided for the execution of government officials who supported the boxers. 
provisions for foreign troops to be stationed in Beijing and 450 million teals of silver, approximately 10 million at today's silver prices and more than the government's annual tax revenue to pay indemnity over the course of the next 99 years to the eight nations involved. The Empress Dowager then sponsored a set of institutional and fiscal changes in an attempt to save the dynasty by reforming it, but reform occurred too slowly to avert its inevitable end. The righteous and harmless fists, Quin Quan, arose in the island section of northern coastal province of Shandong, long known for social unrest, religious sects and martial societies. American Christian missionaries were probably the first to refer to the well-trained athletic young men as boxers because of the martial arts and weapons training they practiced. Their primary practice was a type of spiritual possession which involved the whirling of swords, violent prostrations and chanting incarnations to the deities. The opportunities to fight back western encroachment and colonisation was especially attractive to unemployed village men, many of whom were teenagers. The tradition of possession and invulnerability went back several hundred years but took on special meaning against the powerful new weapons of the west. The boxers, armed with rifles and swords, claimed supernatural invulnerability towards bow, blows of cannon, rifle shots and knife attacks. Furthermore, the boxer groups properly claimed that millions of soldiers of heaven would descend to assist them in purifying China of foreign oppression. These beliefs were characteristics of millenarian movements of nativistist resistance, especially the characteristics of magical beliefs shared by ghost dancers in North America and the Kyalita cults of Africa that the believers would be rendered invulnerable to bullets. In 1895, in spite of ambivalence towards heritage practices, Yuxian and Manchu, who then perfected of Kazuda, would later become provincial governor, used the Big Sword Society in fighting bandits. The Big Swords, embroidered by their official support, also attacked their local Catholic village rivals who turned to the church for protection. The Big Swords responded by tackling Catholic churches and burning them. The line between Christians and bandits, remarked one recent historian, quote, became increasingly indistinct, end quote. As a result of diplomatic pressure in the capital, Yuxian executed several Big Sword leaders but did not punish anyone else. More martial secret societies started emerging after this. The early years saw a variety of village activities, not a broad movement with a united purpose. Martial folk religious societies such as Bangdoa, Eight Trigams, prepared the way for the boxers. Like the red boxing schools or the plum flower boxers, the boxers of Shandong were more concerned with traditional social and moral values such as filial piety than the foreign influences. One leader, Zhu Hundeng, Red Lantern Zhu, started as a wandering healer, specialising in skin ulcers and gave wide respect by refusing payment for his treatments. Zhu claimed descent from Bing, Ming Dynasty Empires, since his surname was the surname of the Ming Imperial family. He announced that his goal was to, quote, revive the Qing Dynasty and destroy the foreigners. The combination of extreme weather conditions, Western attempts at colonising China and growing anti-imperialist sentiment fueled the movement. First a drought followed by floods in Shandong province in 1897 to 1898 forced farmers to flee to cities and seek food. As one observer said, I am convinced that a few days heavily rainfall to terminate the long continued drought would do more to restore tranquility than any measures which either the Chinese government or foreign governments can take. A major cause of discontent in northern China was missionary activity. The Treaty of Tinstin, 
or Tinjan, and the conviction of Peking, signed in 1860 after the Second Opium War, they granted foreign missionaries the freedom to preach anywhere in China and to buy land on which to build churches. On the 1st of November 1897, a band of armed men who were perhaps members of the Big Salt Society stormed the residence of a German missionary from the Society of the Vine's Word and killed two priests. This attack was known as the Yule Incident. When Kaiser Wilhelm II received news of these murders, he dispatched a German East Asia squadron to occupy Quinzhou Bay on the southern coast of Shandong Peninsula. Germany's action triggered a scramble for concessions by which Britain, France, Russia and Japan also secured their own sphere of influence in China. In October 1898, a group of boxers attacked the Christian community of Yongtun village where a temple to the Jade Emperor had been converted into a Catholic church. Disputes had surrounded the church since 1869 when the temple had been granted to the Christian residents of the village. This incident marked the first time the boxers used the slogan, support the king, destroy the foreigners that would they later characterise them. The boxers called themselves the Militia United in Righteousness for the first time one year later at the Battle of Sen Lu Temple, October 1899, a clash between the boxers and King government troops. By using the word militia rather than boxers, they distanced themselves from the forbidden, forbidden martial arts sex and tried to give their movement the legitimacy of a group that defended orthodoxy. Aggression towards missionaries and Christians drew the ire of foreign, mainly European governments. In 1899, the French ministry in Beijing helped the missionaries to obtain an edict granting official status to every order in the Roman Catholic hierarchy, enabling local priests to support their people in legal or family disputes and bypassed the local officials. After the German government took over Shandong, many Chinese feared that the foreign missionaries and quite possibly all Christian activities were imperialistic attempts at, quote, carving the melon, end quote, i.e. to divide and colonize China piece by piece. Chinese officials expressed their animosity towards foreigners succinctly, quote, Take away your missionaries and your opium and you'll be welcome, end quote. The early growth of the boxer movement coincided with the 100 Days Reform, the 11th of June to the 21st of September, 1898. Progressive Chinese governments with support from Protestant missionaries persuaded the Gangzhou Emperor to institute reforms which alienated many conservative officials by their sweeping nature. Such opposition from conservative officials led Emperor Darajus Sisi to interfere and converse the reforms. The failure of the reform movement disillusionized many educated Chinese and thus further weakened the Qing government. After the reforms ended, the conservative Empress Darajus Sisi seized power and placed the reformist Zhengzhou Empire under house arrest. The national crisis was widely seen as being caused by foreign aggression. Foreign powers had defeated China in several wars, forced the right to promote Christianity and impose unequal treaties under which foreigners and foreign companies in China were accorded special privileges. Extraterritorial rights and immunities from Chinese law causing resentment among the Chinese. France, Japan, Russia and Germany carved out spheres of influence so that by 1900 it appeared that China was likely to be dismembered with foreign powers each ruling a part of the country. Thus by 1900 the Qing dynasty had ruled China for more than two centuries was crumbling and Chinese culture was under assault by powerful and unfamiliar religious and secular cultures. In January 1900, with a majority of conservatives in the imperial court, Empress Dowager Zizi changed her boxers and issued edicts in their defence, causing protests from foreign powers. 
In spring 1900, the Boxer movement spread rapidly north from Shandong into the countryside near Beijing. Boxers burned Christian churches, killed Chinese Christians and intimidated Chinese officials who stood in their way. American minister Edwin H. Conger cabled Washington, quote, the whole country is swarming with hungry, discontented, hopeless idlers, end quote. On May 30th, the diplomats led by British minister Claude Maxwell MacDonald requested that foreign soldiers come to Beijing to defend their legations. The Chinese government reluctantly acquiesced. The next day, a multinational force of 435 Navy troops from eight countries disembarked from the warships and travelled by train from Dangu to Beijing. They set up defences perimeters around their respective missions. On the 5th of June, the railway line to Tianjin was cut by boxers in the countryside and Beijing was isolated. On the 11th of June, at Kuangding Gate, the secretary of uh, Japanese legation, Sigma Akira, was attacked and killed by soldiers of General Dong Fuzhan, who was guarding the southern part of the Beijing walled city. Armed with Mauser's rifles but wearing traditional uniforms, Dong's troops had threatened the foreign legations in the fall of 1898, soon after arriving in Beijing. So much that troops from the United States Marine Corps had been called to Beijing to guard the legations. The German Kaiser Wilhelm II was so alarmed by Chinese Muslim troops that he requested Caliph Abdul Hamid II of the Ottoman Empire to find a way to stop the Muslim troops from fighting. The Caliph agreed to the Kaiser's request and sent Enver Pasha, the future young Turk leader, to China in 1901, but the rebellion was over by that time. Also on the 11th of June, the first boxer dressed in his finery was seen in legation quarter. The German minister Clements von Kettler and German soldiers captured a boxer boy and inexplicably executed him. In response, thousands of boxers burst into the walled city of Beijing that afternoon and burned many of the Christian churches and cathedrals in the city, burning some victims alive. American and British missionaries had taken refuge in the Methodist mission and attack there was repulsed by American Marines. The soldiers at the British Embassy and Germans shot and killed several boxers, alienating the Chinese population of the city and nudging the King government towards support of the boxers. The Muslim Gansu braves and boxers along with other Chinese then attacked and killed Chinese Christians along the legations in revenge for the foreign attacks on Chinese. As the situation grew more violent, a second multinational force of 2,000 sailors and marines under the command of British Vice Admiral Edward Seymour, the largest contingent being British, was dispatched from Dengu to Beijing on the 10th of June 1900. The troops were transported by train from Dengu to Tianjin with agreement the Chinese government, but the railway line between Tianjin and Beijing had been severed. Seymour resolved to move forward and repair the railway or progress on foot if necessary, keeping in mind that the distance between Beijing and Beijing was only 120 kilometres. When Seymour left Tianjin and started towards Beijing, it angered the imperial court. As a result, the pro-boxer Manchu Prince Duan became leader of Zongili Yemen, replacing Prince Qing. Prince Duan was a member of the imperial is the Ungiru clan, foreigners called him Blood Royal, and Empress Dowager Zizi had named her son as next in line for the imperial throne. He became the effective leader of the boxers and he was extremely anti-foreigner. He soon ordered the King Imperial Army to attack the foreign forces. Confused by conflicting orders from Beijing, Generals Ni Xian let Seymour's army pass by their in their trains. After leaving Tianjin, the convoy quickly reached Langfang, but found the railway there was to be destroyed. Seymour's engineers tried to repair the line, but the Allied army found itself surrounded, as the railway both behind and in front of them had been destroyed. 
they were attacked from all parts by Chinese irregulars and Chinese government troops. 5,000 of Dung Fu Ang's Gansu Braves and a known number of boxers won a costly but major victory over Seymour's troops at the Battle of Lang Fan on the 18th of June. As the Allied European Army retreated from Lang Fan, they were constantly fired upon by cavalry and artillery bombarded their positions. It was reported the Chinese artillery were superior to the European artillery, since the Europeans did not bother to bring along much, so much for the campaign, thinking they could easily swipe the Chinese resistance. The Europeans could not locate the Chinese artillery, which was raining shells upon their positions. Mining, engineering, flooding and simultaneous attacks were employed by the Chinese troops. The Chinese also employed pincer movements, ambushes and sniper tactics, with some success against the foreigners. News arrived on the 18th of June regarding attacks on foreign legislations. Seymour decided to continue advancing, this time along the Bihu River towards Tongzhou, 25 kilometres from Beijing. By the 19th, they had abandoned their efforts due to progressively stiffening resistance and started to retreat southward along the river with over 200 wounded. Commandeering four civilian Chinese junks along the river, they loaded all their wounded and remaining supplies onto them and pulled them along with their ropes from riverbanks. By this point, they were very low on food, ammunition and medical supplies. Unexpectedly, they then happened upon their great Zugu arsenal, a hidden Qing munitions cache of which the Allied powers had no knowledge until then. They immediately captured and occupied it, discovered not only Krupp field guns, but rifles with millions of rounds of ammunition, along with millions of pounds of rice and ample medical supplies. There they dug in and awaited rescue. A Chinese servant was able to infiltrate through the Boxer and Qing lines, informing the eight powers of Seymour troops predicament. Surrounded and attacked nearly around the clock by Qing troops and Boxers, they were at the point of being overrun. On the 25th of June, a regiment composed of 1,800 men, 900 Russian troops from Port Arthur, 500 British seamen and an ad hoc mix of other assorted alliance troops finally arrived on foot from Taising to rescue Seymour. Spiking the mounted field guns and setting fire to any munitions they could not take, an estimated 3 million worth, Seymour, his force and the rescue mission marched back to Tin Sting unopposed on the 26th of June. Seymour's casualties during the expedition were 62 killed and 228 wounded. Meanwhile, in Beijing on the 16th of June, Empress Dowager Zizi summoned the Imperial Court for a mass audience and addressed the choice between using the boxers to evict the foreigners from the city or seeking a diplomatic solution. In response to a high official who doubtly doubted the efficiency of the boxer's magic, CC replied, quote, Both sides of the debate of the Imperial Court realised that popular support for the boxers in the countryside were almost universal and that suppression would be difficult and unpopular, especially where foreign troops were on the march. End quote. Two factions were active during this debate. On one side were anti-foreigners who viewed foreigners as invasive and imperialistic. They advocated taking advantage of the boxers to achieve the expulsion of foreign troops and foreign influences. The pro-foreigners on the other hand advanced reproachment with foreign government, seeing the boxers as superstitious and ignorant. The event that titled the King Duga Imperial Government towards support of the boxers and a war with the foreign powers was the attack of foreign navies on the Dungu forts near Tijin on the 17th of June 1900. On the 15th of June, Qing Imperial forces deployed electric mines in the river Pilu to prevent the Eight Nation Alliance from sending ships to attack. With a difficult military situation in Tianjin and a total breakdown of communication between Tianjin and Beijing, the Allied nations took steps to reinforce their military presence significantly. 
On the 17th of June, they took the Taiju Fort's command and approaches to Tejin, and from there brought increased the number of troops on shore. When Zizi received an ultimatum demanding that China surrender total control over all military and financial affairs to foreigners, she defiantly stated before the entire Grand Council, quote, Now they, the powers, have started the aggression and the extinction of our nation is imminent. If we just fold our arms and yield to them, I would no faith to see our ancestors after death. If we must perish, why don't we fight to the death? End quote. It was at this point that Zizi began to blockade the legations with the armies of the Peking Field Force, which began the siege. Zizi stated that, quote, I've always been of the opinion that the Allied armies have been permitted to escape too easily in 1860. Only a united effort was then necessary to be given China the victory. Today, at last, the opportunity to revenge has come, end quote, and said that millions of Chinese would join the cause of fighting and the car foreigners since the Manchus have provided great benefits on China. On receipt of the news of the attack of the Dangu Fort on the 19th of June, Empress Dowager Zizi immediately sent an order to the legations that the diplomats and other foreigners depart Beijing under escort of the Chinese army within 24 hours. The next morning, diplomats from the besieged legations met to discuss the Emperor's offer. The majority quickly agreed that they could not trust the Chinese army. Fearing that they would be killed, they agreed to refuse the Empress's demand. The German Imperial Envoy, Baron Kleinmann's Friar von Kettler, was infuriated with the actions of the Chinese army troops and determined to take his complaint to the royal court. Against the advice of his fellow foreigners, the Baron left the legations with a single aide and a team of porters to carry his sedan chair. On his way to the palace, Von Kettler was killed on the streets of Beijing by a Manchu captain. His aide ma managed to escape the attack and carried word of the Baron's death back to the diplomatic compound. At this news, the other diplomats feared they would be murdered if they left the legation quarter, and they chose to continue to defy the Chinese order to depart Beijing. The legislations were hurriedly fortified. Most of the foreign civilians were included and a large number of missionaries and businessmen took refuge in the British legation and the largest of the diplomatic compounds. Chinese Christians were preliminarily housed in the adjacent house palace of Fu of Prince Su who was forced to abandon his property by foreign soldiers. On the 21st of June, Emperor Dowager Zizi declared war against all foreign powers. Regional governors who commanded substantial modernised armies such as Li Hozong at Canton, Yang Shika in Shandong, Zhang Xindong at Wuhan and Li Kunyan at Beijing refused to join an imperial court's declaration of war and withheld knowledge of it from the public in the south. Yang Shika used his own forces to suppress boxers at Shandong and Zhang entered into negotiations with the foreigners in Shanghai to keep his army out of the conflict. The neutrality of these provincial and regional governors left the majority of Chinese out of the conflict. They were called the Mutual Protection of Southwest China. The delegations of the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, United States, Russia and Japan were located in the Beijing Legation Quarter south of the Forbidden City. The Chinese army and boxer regulars besieged the quarter from the 20th of June to the 14th of August 1900. A total of 473 foreign civilians, 409 soldiers and marines and sailors from eight countries and about 3,000 Chinese Christians took refuge there. Under the command of the British Minister to China, Claude Maxwell MacDonald, the staff and military guards defending the compound with small arms, three machine guns, one old muzzle-loaded cannon, which were nicknamed the International Gun because the barrel was British, 
The carriage was Italian, the showers Russian and the crew American. The Chinese Christians in the quarter led the foreigners to the Karen and provided important to the defence. Also under siege in Beijing was Northern Cathedral of the Catholic Church. The Betang was defended by 43 French and Italian soldiers, 33 Catholic foreign priests and nuns and about 320 Chinese Catholics. The defender suffered heavy casualties, especially from lack of food and mines which the Chinese exploded in tunnels dug beneath the compound. The number of Chinese soldiers and boxers besieged the quarter and the Batang is unknown. On the 22nd and 23rd of June, Chinese soldiers and boxers set fire to areas north and west of the British quarter, using it as a frightening tactic to defend the, defeat the attackers. The nearby Halan Academy, a complex of courtyards and buildings that house the quintessential Chinese scholarship, the oldest and richest library in the world, caught fire. Each side blamed the other for the destruction and valuable books it contained. After the failure to burn out the foreigners, the Chinese army adopted an anaconda-like strategy. The Chinese built back barricades surrounding the quarter and advanced brick by brick on the foreign lines, forcing the foreign quarter guards to retreat a few feet at a time. This tactic was especially used in Fu, defended by Japanese and Italian soldiers and sailors, and inhabited by most of the Chinese Christians. Fusillades of bullets and artillery and firecrackers were directed against legations almost every night, but did little damage. Sniper rifle took its toll among the foreign defenders. Despite their numerical advantage, the Chinese did not attempt a direct assault on the legation quarter, and though in words of one of the besieged, quote, it would have been easy by a strong swift movement on the part of the numerous Chinese troops to annihilate the whole of the bloody foreigners in an hour." End quote. American missionary Frank Gamewell and his crew of fighting Parsons fortified the Ligation Quarter but impressed Chinese Christians do most of the physical labour of building defences. The Germans and Americans occupied perhaps the most crucial part of the defensive positions, the Tartar War, holding the top of the 45 foot tall and 40 foot wide wall was vital. The German barricade faced east on the top of the wall and 400 yards west were the west facing American positions. The Chinese advanced towards both positions by building barricades ever closer. Quote, the men all will feel they were trapped, quote, end quote, said the American commander Captain John T. Myers and sip, simply awaited the hour of execution. On the 30th of June, the Chinese forced the Germans off the wall, leaving the American Marines alone in its defence. At the same time, the Chinese barricade was advanced to within a few feet of the American positions, and it became clear that the Americans had to abandon the wall or force the Chinese to retreat. At 2 a.m. on the 3rd of July, 56 British, Russian, and American Marines and sailors under the command of Myers launched an assault against the Chinese barricade on the wall. The attack caught the Chinese sleeping, killed about 20 of them, and expelled the rest of them from the barricades. The Chinese did not attempt to advance their position on the Tartar War for the remainder of the siege. Sir Claude MacDonald said, 13th of July was the most harassing day of the siege. The Japanese and Italians in the Fu were driven back to their last offensive line. The Chinese detonated a mine beneath the French legation, pushing the French and Austrians out of the most of the French, the French legation. On the 16th of July, the most capable British officer was killed, and the journalist George Ernest Morrison was injured. But American Minister Edward Hurd Conger established contact with the Chinese government and on the 17th of July an armistice was declared by the Chinese. More than 40% of the legation guards were dead or wounded. The motivation of the Chinese was probably the realisation that an alleged force of 20,000 men had landed in China and retribution for the siege was at hand. The Manchu general 
Jungulu concluded that it was futile to fight all the powers simultaneously and declined to press home the siege. The Manchu Ziyu, Prince Duan, an anti-foreign friend of Dong Fu Yang, wanted artillery for Dong's troops to destroy the legations. Zhongli blocked the transfer of Tilly to Tzuja and Dong, preventing them from attacking. Zhongli forced Dong Fu Wang and his troops to pull back from completing the siege and destroying the legations, therefore saving the foreigners and making diplomatic concessions. Zhongli and Prince Qing sent food to the legations and used their Manchu bannermen to attack the Muslim Gansu braves. In of Dong Fu Ang and the boxers who were besieging the foreigners. They issued edicts ordering the foreigners to be protected, but the Gansu warriors ignored it and fought against Bannermen who tried to force their way from the Gaetians. The boxers also took command from Dong Fu Ang. Zhang Lu deliberately hid an imperial degree from General Ni Xuan. Degree, degree ordered him to stop fighting the boxers because of the foreign invasion and also because the population was suffering. Due to Zhang Lu's actions, General Ni continued to fight the boxers and killed many of them even as the foreign troops were making their way into China. Zhang Lu also ordered Ni to protect foreigners and save the railway from the boxers. Because parts of the railway were saved under Zhang Lu's orders, the foreign invasion army was able to transport itself into China quickly. General Ni committed thousands of troops against the boxers instead of against the foreigners. Ni was already outnumbered by the Allies by 4,000 men. General Ni was blamed for attacking the boxers at Ronglu let Ni take all the blame. Ni decided to sacrifice his life by walking into range of Allied guns. Su Jingzheng, who served as Qing envoy to many of the same states under siege in the quarter, argued, quote, The invasion of extraterritorial rights and the killing of foreign diplomats are unprecedented in China and abroad, end quote. Su and five other officials urged Dowinger Su Zizi to order the repression of the boxers, the execution of their leaders and their diplomatic settlement with the foreign armies. The Empress Dowager outraged, sentenced Su and the five others to death for, quote, willfully and observably petitioning the Imperial, quote, and building subversive thought, end quote. They were executed on July 28, 1900, and their severed heads were displayed on the Kanju 2 execution grounds in Beijing. Reflecting this vacillation, some Chinese soldiers were quite literally firing at foreigners under siege from their very onset. Cixi did not personally order imperial troops to conduct a siege on the country had ordered them to protect the foreigners in the legations. Prince Yuan led the boxers to loot his enemies within the imperial court and the foreigners, although imperial authorities expelled boxer troops after they left, into the city and went on looting rampage against the pop foreign and imperial forces. Older boxers were sent outside Beijing to halt the approaching foreign armies while the younger men were absorbed into Muslim Gansu army. With conflicting allegiances and pro-priorities motivating the various forces inside Beijing, the situation in the city became increasingly confused. The foreign legations continued to be surrounded by both Qing, Imperial and Gansu forces. While Deng's Fu and Gansu army, now swollen by the additional boxers, wished to press the siege, Zheng Lu's Imperial forces seemed to have largely attempted to follow Empress Dao Zizu's decree and protect the legations. However, to satisfy the conservatives in the imperial court, Zheng Lu's men also fired on the legations and let off firecrackers to give the impression that they too were attacking the foreigners. Inside the legations and out of communication from the outside world, the foreigners simply fired on any targets that presented themselves, including messengers from the imperial court, civilians and besiegers of all persuasions. Deng Fuang was denied artillery held by Zheng Lu, which supported him from levelling the legations, and when he complained to Empress Dowager Zuzu on June 26, 
she dismissed said that your tail is becoming too heavy to wag. The Alliance discovered large amounts of unused Chinese crib artillery and, art and shells after the besiege was lifted. Meanwhile, Armistice, although occasionally broken, and endured until the 13th of August when an Allied army led by British Alfred Gansley approached Beijing to relieve the siege. The Chinese launched their heaviest fuselage on the legislation quarter as the foreign army approached, Chinese forces melted away. Foreign navies started building up their presence along the northern Chinese coast. From the end of April 1900, several international forces were sent to the capital with varying success and the Chinese forces were ultimately defeated by the eight nation alliance of Austria, Hungary, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, the United Kingdom and the United States. Independent of the Alliance of the Netherlands dispatched three cruisers in July to protect its citizens in Shanghai. British Lieutenant General Alfred Gansley acted as the commanding officer of the Eight Nation Alliance, which eventually numbered 50,000 men. The main contingents were composed of Japanese, 20,000, Russian, 13,000, British, 12, French, 3,500, US, 3,400, German, 900, Italy, 800, Austro-Hungarian, 75, and anti-boxer Chinese troops. The 1st Chinese Regiment, which was praised for its performance, consisted of Chinese collaborator service in the British military. The international forces finally captured Taijing on the 14th of July under the command of Japanese Colonel Kariji after a day of fighting. Notable events included the siege of Dangu forts commanding the approaches to Tijang and the bordering and capturing of four Chinese destroyers by British commander Roger Keyes. Along the foreigners to besiege in Tijang was a young American mining engineer named Herbert Hoover who would go on to become the 31st President of the United States. The march from Tijing to Beijing of about 120 kilometres included about 20,000 Allied troops. On the 4th of August, there were approximately 70,000 Qing Imperial troops and anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 boxers along the way. The Allies only encountered minor resistance, fighting battles at Bekang and Yangkung. At Yangkung, the 14th Infantry Regiment of the US and the British Force troops led the assault. The weather was a major obstacle. Conditions were extremely humid, with temperatures sometimes reaching 42 degrees centigrade. These high temperatures and insects plagued the Allies. Soldiers, dehydrators and horses died. Chinese villagers killed Allied troops who searched for wells. The heat killed Allied soldiers who formed, foamed at the mouth. The tactics along the way were gruesome on either side. Allied soldiers beheaded already dead Chinese corpses, bayoneted or beheaded live Chinese civilians and raped Chinese girls and women. Cossacks who was reported to kill Chinese civilians almost automatically and Japanese kicked a Chinese soldier to death. The Chinese responded to the alliance atrocities with similar acts of violence and cruelty, especially towards the captured Russians. Lieutenant Smendley Butler saw the remains of two Japanese soldiers nailed to a wall who had their tongues cut off and their eyes gouged. Lieutenant Butler was wounded during the expedition in the leg and chest, later receiving the Breffet Medal and recognitions for his actions. The international force reached Beijing on the 14th of August following the defeat of the Yang army in the First Sino-Japanese War. The Chinese government invested heavily in the modernization of the Imperial Army, which was equipped with modern miles of repeater rifles and crap artillery. Three modernized divisions consisted of Manchu bannermen protected the Beijing metropolitan region. Two of them under command of the anti-boxer Prince Qing and Zheng Lu, while the anti-foreign Prince Duan commanded the 10,000 strong Heixing or Tiger Spirit Division, which had joined the Gansu Braves and Boxers attacking the foreigners. 
It was a Hainshian captain who was assassinated to German diplomat Kettler. The tenacious army under Ni Xiang received Western style training under German and Russian officers in addition to their modernised weapons and uniforms. They effectively resisted the alliance at the Battle of Tinsing before retreating and outstanding alliance forces with the accuracy of their artillery during the siege of Tijing concessions. The Gansu Braves under Dong Viang where some sources described as ill-disciplined with armed um, with modern weapons but were not trained according to western drill and wore traditional Chinese uniforms. They led to the defeat of the alliance at Quan Langfang in the Simo expedition and were most ferocious in besieging legations in Beijing. Some banner forces were given modernised weapons and western training becoming the metropolitan banner forces which were decimated in the fighting. Among the Manchu dead was the father of the writer Lei Shi. The British won the race against the international forces to be the first to reach the besieged litigation quarter. The US were able to play a role due to presence of US troops and troops stationed in Manila since the US conquest of the Philippines during the Spanish American War and the subsequent Philippine insertion. In US military, the action in the Boxer Rebellion was known as the Chinese Relief Expedition. United States Marines scaling the walls of Beijing is an iconic image of the Boxer Rebellion. The British Army reached the legation quarter on the afternoon of 14th of August and relieved the quarter. The Bataan was relieved on the 16th of August, first by Japanese soldiers and officially by the French. Early hours of the 15th of August, just as the foreign legations were relieved, Empress Dowager Zizi, dressed in the padded blue costume of a farm woman, the Gangzhou Empire, and a small retinue climbed into a three wooden ox carts and escaped from the city covered with rough blankets. Legend has it that Empress Dowager then ordered the Gangzhou Emperor's favourite concubine, Consul Zen, be thrown down a well in the forbidden city or tricked her into drowning herself. The journey was made all more arduous by the lack of preparation by the Empress Dowager insisted this was not a retreat, rather a tour of inspection. After several weeks of travel, the party arrived in Ziyang in Shanzhou province beyond protective mountain passes where the foreigners could not reach deep in Chinese Muslim territory and protected by Gangzhou braves. The foreigners had no orders to persuade the Dowager, so they decided to stay put. Beijing, Tijiang and other cities in northern China were occupied for more than one year by the International Expeditionary Force under command of German General Alfred Graf von van der See. Atrocities by foreign troops were common. French troops ravaged the countryside around Beijing on behalf of the Chinese Catholics. The Americans and British paid General Yu Xinyang and his army the right division to help the eight national alliance suppress the boxers. Yang Shikar's forces killed 10,000 of people in their anti-boxer campaign in Zili province and Shandong after the alliance captured Beijing. Young operated out of Beijing during the campaign which ended in 1902. Li Hongzhang commanded Chinese soldiers to kill boxers to resist the foreign invaders. From the Chinese viewpoint, as well as reports from contemporary Western observers, German, Russian and Japanese troops received the traditional or the greatest criticism for their ruthlessness and willingness to wantonly execute Chinese of all ages and backgrounds, sometimes burning and killing entire village populations. One newspaper called the Aftermath of the Siege of Carnival or a Loot and others called it an orgy of looting by soldiers, civilians and missionaries. These characterizations called to mind the sacking of the Summer Palace in 1860. Each nationality accused the other of being the worst looters. Some but by no means all Western missionaries took an active part in calling for retribution. To provide uh, re 
restitution to missionaries and Chinese Christian families whose property has been destroyed. Many bannermen supported the boxers and shared their anti-foreign sentiment. The German minister Klein von Kettler was assassinated by Manchu bannermen had been devastated in the First Sino-Japanese War in 1895 and banner armies were destroyed while resisting the invasion. In the words of historian Pamela Crosley, their living conditions went, quote, from desperate poverty to misery, end quote. When thousands of Manchus fled south from Agun during the fighting in 1900, their cattle and horses were stolen by Russian Cossacks, who then burned their villages and homes to ashes. After the capture of Peking by the foreign armies, some of the dowagers' advisers advocated the war be carried on, arguing that China could not be, could not be defeated by the foreigners as it was disloyal and traitorous to the people within the China to allow Beijing and Tejing to be captured by the Allies. On the 17th of September 1901, the King Imperial Court agreed to sign the Boxer Protocol, also known as the Peace Agreement between the Eight Nation Alliance and China. The protocol ordered the execution of 10 high-ranking officials linked to the outbreak and were found guilty for the slaughter of foreigners in China. China was fined war rep reparations of 455,000 tells of silver for the loss of it cause. This was to be paid over 39 years with interest at 4%. To help the payment it was agreed to increase the existing tariff from an actual 3.8% to 5% to tax duty free merchandise. A large proportion of repreparations to pay to the United States were diverted to pay for the education of Chinese students in US universities under the Boxer Indemnity Scholarship Program. To prepare the students chosen for this program, an institute was established to teach English language and to serve as a preparatory school. When the first these students returned to China, they undertook the teachings of subsequent students. From this institute was born the Tizhou University. Some of the rep reputations the Britons were lately marked for a similar program. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Brief History Podcast. As always, please share, like, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Brief History Podcast, same as Instagram. Our Twitter is at B History Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Knight. Thank you for listening once again. Please engage with us on social media. We'll put a poll on what we're going to vote for the next episode. Um, share that. Please vote. If you've got any ideas, let me know. We can include the options into the poll too. This is your host, Andrew Knight, and the Brief History Podcast. My mom has a permanently stuck in the 80s thing. We're talking teased up feathered hair, acid washed denim jacket, and shoulder pads. So many shoulder pads. But I just got a new phone from AT&T. And check this out. I got a second phone to gift my mom. So now she can finally ditch her old one for a phone that can actually stream all the 80s shows she loves. Come into an AT&T store and find out how to get a smartphone on us. AT&T. More for your thing. That's our thing. See store for details.